Good evening and welcome to our program tonight. I'm Stan Adams. I'm with the Word and Sword TV broadcast and we're glad to be coming to you live from Hickory, North Carolina. And we do stress live. This is a live program. Uh, you will be uh, given a phone number, 828-485-5555. That will, focus, that will scroll on all the charts we have throughout the night. You are invited to join in to the program by calling in with questions or comments that you may have. Our operators are standing by to receive your questions. Uh, and uh, if you do not want to come on the air, they will also be screening you on coming on the air. But if you would like to come on the air, they'll go through a screening process with you and then you'll be able to come on the air and uh, just mo much like all live talk radio, uh, kind of the same way. And uh, this program is the same way as that, except it's not radio. So we encourage you to call in tonight with your Bible questions and comments. And even if you disagree with us, we do want you to get your Bibles out because this program is called The Word and the Sword. And the Word of God is powerful, Romans 1.16. And it is more powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, Hebrews chapter 4. And so we need to recognize that the Word of God is our authority in all things that we do. And in religious matters, we would have unity, as Jesus prayed for in John 17, if we all would abide by the same standard and by the same rule. I'm assuming that you're a person that believes in the Word of God as the inspired Word of God, and we appreciate it so much that you've tuned in to be with us tonight. Uh, we want to thank Brother Ron Halbrook, who uh, was on the program last week, had a great presentation. If you missed that, uh, call in tonight and we'll be glad to send you a copy of that or sh give you a website where, we where you can go and get it yourself. And again, we appreciate so much you being with us tonight. Here's the information. The call operators are standing by tonight and you can call and ask for a copy of this presentation or a free Bible correspondence course or you can even take a correspondence course online if you have the capability to do that. You can call in and ask for a free tract, which is nothing but a written sermon, on any number of Bible subjects. You name the subject that you would like one on, that's a Bible subject, and we'll do our best to find the information you need and send that to you. You can ask for a map to our building, or you can just Google the address of the building in your, in your um, Garmin or whatever you have, or your phone. You could ask to be added to the Beacon's mailing list. That is the monthly publication of the Newton Church of Christ. And you can get a free Bible study aids by going to www.wordandsword.com and uh, just go up there and uh, we'll be glad. There's a lot of information that's on there and uh, you've availed yourself of that, that tremendous uh, stuff we have there for Bible study. Also, you can call in tonight with your biblical question or comment and we'll do our very best to provide you with a book, chapter, and verse answer for that question or comment that you have. And we're hung up. So if you will also recognize that you can uh, contact us by going to Facebook at www.facebook.com slash word and sword. And you can go to facebook.com Newton North Carolina Church of Christ also on Facebook, either one of those sites and make your comments. We'll have a discussion with you there if you'd like. And also you can follow us on Twitter at Word and Sword. And you can post up your question there and we'll get back with you uh, as you come up for those, for those things. Now, call in tonight though. While the program's going on, we're going to be talking about 50 things that are found only in Christ. And, you know, it's, it, it's really important for you to be in Christ. You can't be saved without Christ. John 14, verse 6, you can't come to the Father except through Him. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. What does it mean to be in Christ? We want to be in Christ, but not everybody is. So how do we get in Christ? And once we're in Christ, what are the blessings that we have only in Christ? I want to invite you to attend the assemblies at the 656 St. James Church Road of the Newton Church of Christ. And uh, the regular assembly times are at 9.30 and 11 and on Sundays and then Wednesday night Bible study at 7 o'clock. And uh, be sure you go and uh, visit the brethren there and uh, they will be glad to make you welcome. The Word and Swords brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. Do not send any money please. The church there pays for all of this 
and uh, they have funded it for years and they will continue to do that as long as they can. You can contact us by going to email uh, contact at wordandsword.com and you can call by phone at 828-465-3009 or by just snail mail by P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina 28658. Remember the website is www.wordandsword.com. So call your neighbors, sit down somewhere where you can turn and study your Bible without going to sleep. And let's study the Bible together as we go into our study tonight. What's the most important thing in the world? Most important question. What is, what's the destiny of my soul as I stand right now? Friend, if you died right now, where would you go? Would you go to heaven? Would you go to hell? Would you go to Abraham's bosom? Would you go to paradise? Would you go to torments? Where would you go? Would you die in a right relationship with God or with the wrong one? Because we are not promised, according to James chapter 4, our life is a vapor. It appears for a short time and then vanishes away. So it's imperative that every last one of us has in our minds that we're going to do our best to be pleasing to God so that when we die we can live with Him forever. None of us wants to be lost and the Lord doesn't want us to be lost. But the fact is, people, not all people will obey the Lord and do what He says. Have you heard the Word of God? Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing the Word of God. See how the Word is important? We have to hear it. And not just hear it, not be forgetful hearers, but doers of what He says. Jesus said that we must hear and we must believe. And God said we must hear, hear what the Lord says, what Jesus says. And then if you look in John 8, 24, that unless you believe that I am He, you'll all die in your sins. Romans 10, 10, with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Galatians 3 and verse 26, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith it's impossible to please Him, for he that comes to Him must believe He is, and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. But we can't just leave it at hearing and believing, friends. We've got to look also further in what Jesus said about salvation. And in Luke 13 and verse 3, we must accept you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Acts 17 and verse 30, the times of this ignorance, God winked at, but now commands men everywhere to come to repentance. Acts 2:38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. So repentance or a change of lifestyle is required to be a true servant of the Lord and be born into the family of God. And then we must confess. If we confess Christ before men, He'll confess us before His Father in heaven, Matthew 10, 32. Acts 8, 27 through 39, the Ethiopian eunuch was taught about Jesus from Isaiah 53 and Philip was teaching him and he said, well, here's some water. What keeps me from being baptized? He said, if you believe, you can. And then he confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Romans 10.10 10 says we must confess with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then look at baptism. All of these, the first passages on every one of these, are things that were said by Jesus, friends. And most people up here, there's a lot of people up here in this area, in my experience, that don't believe anything but the, King, but the red letter edition. Well, there it is. John 12, 48, John 8, 24, Luke 13, 3, Matthew 10, 32, and Mark 16, 16. Jesus said all these things, friends. So in order to be saved, we must be baptized based upon our faith, our repentance, and our confession that is built by hearing the Word of God. And Mark 16, 16, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. We've already read Acts 2.38, Romans 6, 4 through 8. Baptism is a likeness of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. After we die to sin, we are buried in water for, and, and raised to walk a new life. And the blood is applied in the water. Galatians 3.27, we put Christ on in baptism. If we've been baptized into Christ, we have put on Christ. And 1 Peter 3.21 teaches the necessity of baptism. The like foot figure where even baptism doth also now save us. So, to get into Christ, to be born into the family of God, we must be immersed. 
and water for the remission of our sins. And that water is where we find the blood. Well, what happens after we do all that? After I'm born into the family, I'm just a baby. So now what do I do? Well, I've got to be faithful to the Lord. I can't be an on-again, off-again Christian. I have to be one that's committed. So again, if I fulfill the commandments that are above with baptism, confession, repentance, belief, and hearing, then I am born into the family of God. The Lord adds me to His universal church. And then I locate myself with a church that follows the Bible pattern. How do I know if it follows the Bible pattern? I have to look and see if it's following the Bible pattern by the Bible. Ask questions. All right, join myself to a local congregation of people that have done what the Lord says to do, just like I've done. So you'll be a Christian. You're expected to serve God faithfully unto death, Revelation 2.10. And then Matthew 24, verse 13, we are to endure till the end, friends. So we have to do that. And so we must be faithful. It's not once saved, always saved. It is, uh, or once in grace, always in grace. We must be faithful to the Lord. Now we're going to talk tonight about things that are found in Christ. And just note that in Christ that we're going to be talking about tonight. The book of uh, Ephesians is pretty much a treatise on God's plan for us in salvation and being in Christ. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, it says there, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us, watch this, with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Now what that passage tells us, friends, is that all spiritual blessings are in Christ. Well, let's look at that for just a moment. I, John chapter 1 and verse 4, when I'm a Christian, I live in Christ. I'm supposed to be, live my life that way. In Him was life, and the life was the light of man. So the life of Christ is a life I need to live. I need to follow His steps. And in Ephesians chapter 1, there's some uh, 13 different verses in Ephesians that talk about being in Christ and what it does for us. Follow me, if you will, through the book of Ephesians. You have your Bibles? Please get them out. We don't have charts on this, but Ephesians, let's just follow me through. In Ephesians 1, in verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints that are at Ephesus, and to those who are faithful in Christ Jesus. They're what? They're faithful in Christ Jesus. Those are the Christians at Ephesus. Follow me to verse 3. We just read it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now just read that backwards. Outside of Christ, what? None of those blessings are there, are they? Well, verse 4, according as He has chosen us, watch it, in Him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blemish before Him in love. All right, then look, if you will, at verse 6, to the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved." That's Jesus. Then notice verse 7, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace." Talking about Christ. And we'll, we'll expand on these as we go through tonight. But look at verse 7, "...in whom we have redemption through His blood." Verse 9, "...having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, that He hath purposed in Himself, talking of Jesus. Verse 10, that in the dispensations of the fullness of time He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and on earth, even in Him." All right, now, verse 11, "...in whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose, who works all things after the counsel of His own will." So in whom? In Christ we have all things. All right, verse 12 of Ephesians 1, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. There's tremendous trust we can place in Christ because He'll never disappoint us, never forsake us, and never leave us if we walk in Him. Verse 13 of chapter 1, this is the last one, 
in whom ye have also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Sealed in Christ. So we'll talk about that tonight. Now God is, uh, Jesus is the Son of God, friends. Do you believe that? You have to believe that or the rest of it doesn't matter, does it? If Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, then what are you doing listening to this program and watching this TV? Okay? If Jesus Christ is not the Son of God, what does it matter how we live? Why don't you just go and live like you want to, take what you want to, get what you want to, hurt who you want to? Don't worry about it if Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God. Because if He's not the Son of God, as Paul states in 1 Corinthians 15, if in this life only we have hope, we are of all men most miserable. So a miserable life awaits those that choose to walk outside of Christ. All right? So Christ was, in Him was life, John chapter 1 and verse 4. And the life was the light of men. Jesus lit up the world, folks, when He came into this world. He was born into this world. Luke chapter 2 is an account of that in other passages. But we see there that He came into the world and He, uh, he made a noise from the very first day. And the angels sang that He had come. And He lived 33 years on this earth in the flesh of a man. Deity dwelt in man for you and me. He suffered a horrendous death. But yet life is found in Him. You ever wonder why life and death are so closely associated when it comes to spiritual things? Notice what happens to happen to us to be in Christ and to be alive in Christ. We have to die. Jesus taught this when He was on this earth when He says, look at the grains, look at the wheat. For wheat to come up, it has to first of all die in order to live. And so we die. But that's not the end. If we live in Christ, if we die in Christ, then we have a tremendous resurrection awaiting us. And we look forward to that. A hope in Christ Jesus. Well, let's look on. In John chapter 1 and verse 4, we see that life is in Christ. And then we see in Romans chapter 3 and verse 24, we see redemption is in Christ. So, do you have your Bibles? Go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 3 and verse 24 and read along with me. And again, you make sure that I'm reading what the Bible says. All right? So, reading what the Bible says from the English Standard Version here, it said, You are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So, I'm a recipient of the grace of God when I'm obedient to Christ Jesus. There are those who would say, well, you know, preacher, don't you know that you're just saved by grace? There's not anything you can do about it. The Lord either saves you or He doesn't. And the grace is all we need. We just need grace. Well, friends, God can extend a gift to us all He wants to. And He has, the gift of His Son. I could be saved by doing what He has told me to do if I love Him. But I don't have to. I can reject Him. And if I reject Him, I am not under His grace. So there are some things that we must do. Just like a person to receive a gift and the benefits of it must unwrap the present and must open the box to receive any benefit. Otherwise, you just have a box that's taped shut. A gift is in it, but you haven't enjoyed the benefits of it until you open and receive the box. So, even so, with grace, the same thing. Are we saved by grace? Yes. Are we saved by grace alone? No. Are we saved by faith? Yes. Are we saved by faith alone? No. What does redemption mean? Have you ever thought about that? Did you know the whole story of the Bible is the redemption of mankind from chapter 3 on? Man was walking in perfect relationship with God in the garden. And he was told one, one negative. Of all the trees of the garden you can eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you cannot eat. For in the day you eat, you shall surely die. So when man disobeyed God, 
and consumed fruit that he shouldn't have had, then he fell away from the relationship that was perfect. And so paradise was lost. That beautiful garden was closed up to man. And man had some penalties for his sin. I don't inherit those penalties. I don't inherit Adam's sin, nor do you. But the consequence of it is death. And the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And the consequences of Adam's sin we do bear. Death will come to all of us. So how do I get back in relationship with God? That's the story of redemption. That's how God, who had in His mind before time began, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1, according to, as He has, uh, as He hath chosen us in Him, watch this, verse 4, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. Do you know God's plan precedes time? God's plan for you is older than time. He had, in, had it all in His mind. And he was going to do it. It's called the scheme or the plan of redemption. We use the term scheme to talk about something that's kind of underhanded sometimes. But all a scheme is, a schematic or a scheme is just a plan, a plan for redemption. And it's not an afterthought. A scheme or a schematic is something that has been done with purpose. And so God has had in mind a purpose for mankind. And the purpose we have, why am I here? I'm here to glorify God if I, if I choose to. But God will not take over our free will. He will not make us serve Him. So it is our choice. And so God made us with a free will. Did you know we're the only part of God's creation that has the ability to say no to Him and walk away from Him? Everything else in this world operates by cycles and by set laws. And we have a standard that we can accept the laws of God or we can reject them. Isn't it something with all God's given to us that we are the people that will reject Him and walk away from Him? Redemption, it, kindness, long-suffering, mercy, patience, is given to us, and salvation is there waiting for us. Redeeming, God redeeming man back to Himself. Now keep that theme in mind as you read your whole Bible, friends, because that is the theme of all 66 books of the Bible. Now while the Bible is divided into 66 different books, it is one story and one plan and one thread running throughout. Redemption in Christ first prophecy of Christ is in Genesis 3.15. And so it's through the seed of woman that man would be saved and man, Satan would be defeated. And so it's through Christ that we have that. The promise is later in Genesis 12 given to Abraham and then to Isaac in chapter 15 and then on to uh, Jacob in chapter 17. So we have an opportunity to follow the plan of God as we read His Word. Now many of you have, have called in, and some of you have seen me out in, in, in the neighborhoods, and many of you have said, well, I've read the Bible, or I'm reading the Bible through. Did you know I've read that through three or four times? Good for you. But have you ever read it through with the idea that the whole plan, the whole central message of the Bible is the redemption of, of mankind through Christ. And seeing the Old Testament shadows and the New Testament fulfillment, the old prophecies and the New Testament fulfillment, did you know that all the prophecies of the Bible, except for the return of Christ, have taken place already? They've all taken place. And the only thing we're waiting for is to go be in heaven. We're not waiting for Armageddon. We're not waiting for tribulation. We have that every day. We're not waiting for a grand battle with all the physical kingdoms of the earth, nor are we looking for Jesus to come back and set up His kingdom. It's already here. If not, He's, he's not King Jesus. So 
Redemption in Jesus Christ. Friend, have you been redeemed like the Lord says? Not have you been redeemed like man will tell you, but have you been redeemed like the Lord would tell you? Well, another thing that's found in Christ is life. We're alive to God in Christ, and without being in Christ, we're not alive to God. We're dead in sin. So what does it mean to be alive? Well, we all know that it takes, it takes oxygen to live, doesn't it? We have to be able to breathe. We, our bodies have to be able to function. And so there is life-giving force that is given to all mankind when we first come into this world. First thing we do that we're called upon to do is breathe. And the doctor may smack us to get us to breathe, you know, pretty violent way to come into the world, but hey, it's what we need. And so we have breath, we have life, and we have an opportunity from the first day we're born, from then till when we die, what we do in between determines where we live forever. Alive to God in Christ. Romans 6 and verse 14, or verse 11, I'm sorry. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ. Now friends, tonight if you're not alive, if you're, not, if you're still living in sin, then there's no way in the world you can be alive to God in Christ Jesus. You can't do both. You have to come away from one. Do you see that in the passage? You must also consider yourselves dead to sin. Paul said it this way, I no longer live, but Christ lives, watch this, in me. Paul knew how to live in Christ, didn't he? He knew the blessings in Christ. And he had put sin away in his life. He, was dead. he had become dead or numb to sin. He didn't want it anymore in his life. Now, did that mean Paul did not, did not sin? No. Because he says he buffets his body daily, lest after having preached to others he would become castaway. Paul knew what many people don't know today, and that's that he could fall away. Well, do we have to fight the battle against sin? Yes, we do. And somebody says, does it get easier? In some ways it does, and in some ways it doesn't. Identifying sin as we grow in Christ is not our problem. The biggest problem that is in the church of our Lord is people that know to do good and won't do it. Lazy Christians. Read a passage that says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And they sit in their recliner day after day after day after day and say, I'll get around to it one day, Lord. See, that's a sin. And people don't think of it that way. Most people think sins are things like, you know, commit fornication, getting drunk, murdering people, stealing from people. Well, it's much deeper than that. The Lord has a high standard, friends. And we must see our life in Christ for just what it is, to be alive in Christ. Have you ever had a close call, and then after you come away from that close call, maybe an accident on the highway or something, you just feel like, hey, I've got to reevaluate my life. I've got to look here again and live my life and not just exist. The Lord wants active people. He wants us to be alive. Christ died to make us alive. So we must be diligent in our service to the Lord alive to God in Christ. And people that are alive to God in Christ cannot be still, cannot be quiet for the Lord. They'll be telling people about it. They'll be talking about it. They'll be making time for the Lord. They'll set their priorities with the Lord. He comes first and everything else comes second. Falls in line. Well, what else is in Christ? Well, one of the things that's in Christ is eternal life. Now, someone says, well, I thought we just covered that. We talked about redemption. Well, being redeemed is different than having eternal life in Christ, friends. I can be redeemed, but I haven't yet received eternal life because time hasn't ended. But I have eternal life in Jesus Christ. The wages of sin, Romans 3, 20, 6, 23, is death. But the free gift of God is this, eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I can't have eternal life. I can't live in heaven with Jesus if I don't serve Him here. So, if I'm a Christian here, then I have eternal life 
with the Father. It's a promise that I can have eternal life. But I don't have eternal life in my possession right now, but I will if I stay faithful to what He's told me to do. And we can all be that way if we are obedient to what He has told us to do. Well, let's look at another thing in Christ Jesus. We've got several of them that we're going to be covering tonight. So let's look at some other things. There's no condemnation in Christ. Now somebody says, well, I thought you just said that if you're in Christ, you wouldn't, that you would still sin. Well, yes, that's true. But Christ has provided a way whereby those born into His family, those who are adopted by the Lord, that they can repent and pray to God, and their sins are forgiven. Forgiveness of sin, remember? Redemption. God redeemed us through the blood of His Son. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that a person in Christ won't slip and fall. Paul lived in fear of it himself. But we have to set our course. And if we do sin, we're going to be like Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8, who said that thought he could buy the gift of the Holy Spirit with money. And he was told to repent and pray God that the thought of his heart can be forgiven. Christians can be forgiven, friends, for what they do. And really, we're the only ones that can after we're baptized into Christ. So we have a relationship with the Lord. We are God's children. And He is he not willing to condemn us when we sin, but He doesn't condone us when we sin either. So we have condemning and condoning. Now just because the Lord has, has promised to give us forgiveness through the blood of His Son as we repent and turn from our sins, as we are born into the family, we are His children, He will forgive us. But He will never condone us in our sin. Jesus Christ came to this world, friends, not so we could die in, or be comfortable in sin, not to save us in sin, but to save us from sin. And so that's the, this is another blessing, one of these spiritual blessings that we've seen in Christ Jesus. Now let's go back over them. Let's don't go too fast. Let's go back and pick up what we had. No condemnation in Christ. Do you have that down? You might want to write these down and put them on your refrigerator for next week. There's no condemnation in Christ. And then we see there's eternal life in Christ. And then we see that we are alive to God in Christ. And then we see that there is redemption in Christ. And then we see there is life in Christ. Well, did you get all those? Well, I'll give you a few minutes. I'll linger a little bit on some of these. And then we'll come on through. Hope you're enjoying our Bible study tonight. Hope you're enjoying our study together as we see the wonderful blessings of being in Christ. And remember, these spiritual blessings are not found anywhere else but in Christ. Okay? So we must be in Christ. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Well, do you remember the old movie that said, where freedom, the Scottish fella calls out William Wallace, and he says freedom as he dies? What is freedom all about? Well, we live in a country where, where in freedom is a common uh, theme. Being free. What does that mean? Does it mean I can do anything I want to? Well, in one sense, no. In another sense, yes. Because if I'm in Christ, my wants change. So can I live like I want to in Christ? Yep. But the way I want to is according to Christ. So I have freedom in Christ. So many people, and maybe you're one of them, they seem to think that being a Christian is some type of bondage, that we're we're put up and locked up in a prison somewhere and we can't have any fun. No, just the opposite. We are released from the bondage of sin and made alive to the freedom that is in Christ Jesus. Do you realize how many blessings we have? Notice that throughout the Bible, particularly in Galatians and chapter 5 and also in Philippians, we put off and we put on. We put off the old man, we put on the new man. We see there that in Galatians 5, there are works of the flesh that we put, on, put off, but there's fruits of the Spirit that we put on. And these fruits of the Spirit are every one of them superior 
to any sin that may be tempor that's temporary that you could participate in, friends. Freedom in Christ. Are you free in Christ? Again, not free to do whatever you choose because remember, you died in Christ. You died to self so that Christ could be made alive in you. Romans 8 and verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Friends, the bad news is that we were on our way to eternal torment. And the Lord sent His Son to die for us so that we might be made free in Christ. Now, if you're, you, you know that old song, Count Your Many Blessings? So many of us want to count, well, I'm glad I have my house, and I'm glad I got kids, and I'm glad I got some money in the bank, and I'm going to count my many, I'm counting my many blessings. <laughs> it's not what it means, although those blessings come from God, and we understand they're a part of life here, and we are to be thankful for them. But being thankful for the things, our many blessings, goes so much deeper than just the things we see. These relationships that we have in Christ are the things that are truly valuable. And friends, if you're watching tonight and you're a wayward child of God, you know what that means. If you've walked away from serving the Lord, then you have walked away from the richest blessings that could ever exist. All the things that He's done for you, you just walked away. You just counted them as garbage. And the valuable things of life you have put away for the temporary pleasures of this life. You can do that. It's your choice. But oh, what a loss. What is a man profited if he gains the whole world and has it his way here? Frank Sinatra had it his way here. But I tell you what he doesn't, from the way that he lived and the way he behaved, if he didn't repent, if he didn't obey the gospel before he died, he doesn't have it his way now. So, are you looking for it your way now, or do you want it God's way? What's most important to you? If you're watching tonight, and maybe you're a young person, and you're just all caught up in school and the activities of school and ball and, and all the activities of this world and parents, maybe you're pushing them along those directions. All that will fade one day. All you have to do, and the older I get, the more I realize that. You know, I can't, I can't pivot like I used to on a basketball court. I can't even hit a golf ball like I used to. And I tell you, those things that were so important to us when we were coming up, oh my, they began to fade. The body was never meant to stay here. Learn that early. The Ecclesiastes writer says in Ecclesiastes 12, all that's been hurt, been, been said. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What is a man to do but fear God and keep His commandments? For this is the whole of man. Friends, are you fearing God and keeping His commandments? If you are, there is true freedom in Christ Jesus. If you're doing it like the Bible says. If I fear God properly, I'll do what He says. I'll obey Him. If He tells me to, to walk through a wall, I'll start walking, and He can either open it up or just not, not open it up. It's up to Him. But whatever God tells me to do, He has a reason. And He has told me there is true freedom in Christ Jesus. Not only is there freedom in Christ Jesus, friends, there's the love of God. Do you know what it's like not to be loved? Many people do. Many people live very sad lives on this earth. Many people have, have, been, have many broken hearts from the loss of many things in this life, the loss of a relationship, the loss of goods. Many people in the Philippines right now, uh, we were talking before we went on the air tonight, that many people in the Philippines are suffering from just monsoon type of weather right now, typhoon, and it's horrible. And they know what it's like to lose everything they have over and over and over again. But you know what? They know God loves them. 
There are some of you that may be in hospitals tonight watching the TV, and you may have one thing after another come up on you, and you're just seems like there's no end to the frustrations. Do you know what that helps you to realize? That this life is not all there is, and I don't want to live here forever. I want to go be with God. I want God to love me. And notice that in Romans 8 verse 39, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present or to come, nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now he's not saying there we can't walk away from God. He's just saying there is no outside force anywhere either in heavenly places or on this earth that can shake us from what God has in mind for us. We are the only one that can say to ourselves, I will not serve God anymore. And we can't blame it on anyone but us. You can't blame it on an angel. You can't blame it on some power of some kind or anything that's been or is to come. Nothing can do it. The Lord's promised it. But we can walk away. We can do it. And so it's an inside out job. Would you want to say to God, I do not love you? Well, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Now, what does that mean? That means prove your love. Jesus showed his love for man to, in dying for him, but not, that, was, that wasn't the only time. He showed his love for his apostles when he washed their feet. He showed his love for the 5,000 when he gave them the words of life. And in John 6, those words of life were much more filling than the five loaves and two fishes he fed them with earlier. You see the value of spiritual blessings that are only found in Christ. Now friends, tonight I want to tell you something, and you've probably been following along. You remember we told you to underline the term in Christ? Well, in Christ is the only place that these spiritual blessings can be found. Somebody says, does God hate me if I'm not a Christian? He doesn't hate anybody. He loves us all, but He loves His children especially. I mean, I love my neighbor, but I love my wife a whole lot more, and I love my kids a whole lot more. So my family means a whole lot more to me than my neighbors, even though I love them. I love my country, but the church is more important than my country. The Lord is much more important than the things of this life, but it doesn't mean I don't love. And in the same way, God still loves all mankind. He's long-suffering to all of us, not willing that any should perish, Peter tells us but that all should come to repentance. He wants us to go to heaven. He's pulling for us. But He's not going to make us go to heaven. And so we must be motivated by loving God. Somebody says, why should I love God? Well, if God loves me, shouldn't I also love Him? You want to read about this, turn to 1 John. And look at chapters 2 and 3 when it talks about the love of God. That if we say we love God and don't love our brother, we lie. If I say I love God and don't do several things, then I lie. You see how love is expressed? Now I may be stepping on some toes tonight on this illustration, but it's a pretty sad marriage where love is not reinstated regularly. And it's a whole lot more than just saying you love somebody. You know, you can say the words all day long, but if your words aren't backed by your actions, they're just words. And so the love of God is not just words that He bestowed upon us. He loved us enough to send His Son. And then we love Him enough to what? To be obedient to Him. And as a result, we know that God loves us because we are in His family. We are in Christ. Well, another thing that's found in Christ is there's one body in Christ Jesus. Well, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 5, do you have your Bible still? I hope you do. 
For as in one body we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function, so we, though we're many, are one body in Christ, and we're individually members of one, members of one another. Friends, one thing you'll find from the reading of the book of Ephesians is a common idea of the, of the church itself. The word church occurs nine times in the Ephesian letter. Chapter 1 and verse 22, chapter 3 and verse 10, chapter 5 and verse 23, 24, 25, and 27, 29, and 32. And the term body that refers to the church occurs nine more times. So the church is a theme in the book of Ephesians. So we can't be in Christ and not be in His body. We of the body of Christ, Christians, are one body. We have many members, but not all members have the same function. Now, my little finger does not think for me, thankfully. It receives orders from my brain, okay? But I can't do without my little finger without being hampered, all right? So every part of my body has a function, doesn't it? The brain thinks, the fingers help us to grab things and to grapple with things and to use things. And even the most insignificant disposable parts of our body, we would think, we miss them when they're gone. Okay? So we, though many, we Christians, though many, are one body in Christ and individually we're members of one another. Now he's not saying there that all denominational people, all the denominations of the world are all members of the, of the one body of Christ. No. The Lord has one body. He has one spirit. There is one church. So the body is the church. Christ has a body, friends. You do too. You have one head and one body. So if Christ is the head of the body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the church then he has one body, one church. Now we can't do, we have to march by what the head tells us, doesn't it? So that would eliminate churches that are set up by men that don't follow what that man has said, or that follow what the man had said. We march to the orders of the head. Who's our head? Christ. Christ isn't the head of denominations, friends. He didn't found the church. They did. And as you look at the first digression of the church, men departed. It was happening in the book of Galatians, chapter 1 and verse 6, starting right then, where Paul says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed of him to him that called you unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but there are some who would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Paul was amazed that they were falling away so quickly. Now, what eventually happened from the departures of the first century then the second century comes up, third century, Council of Nicaea declares Christianity the state religion of Rome after being after Rome killing every Christian they could find. And then from 300 on, we find that there is a real swift departure until in 606, the Catholic Church comes up. And then after the Catholic Church, we had the Protestant Reformation not many years after. And so in the history of man, departures have been happening from the very inception of the church. You look at all the admonitions to the, in the epistles, 15 different books that Paul talks to Christians and tells them to behave and not depart. And then you look at Revelation 2 and 3 and you see five of the seven churches that are leaving the Lord so badly that he says, you're in danger of me putting out my light, that I've been a part of you, but I'm not going to be. Does Christ dwell where there is darkness? No. Can, can He? It's, it's one of the imperatives of deity that deity cannot and will not dwell where there is darkness. Deity is holy, and deity dwells in holiness, and that's why God wants us to be holy. Somebody says, well, I can't ever be holy. In Christ you can. You can't do it by yourself, but you can do it through Christ. That's why Paul says we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So friends, it does matter what church you belong to, doesn't it? Because it's only in the body of Christ 
that salvation is found, that the saved dwell. One body, we have many members and the members do not all have the same function. Many Christians, but only one body of Christ. We are individually members one of another. So what your brethren do matters. You know, some people say, I just want to go to church and everybody leave me alone. No, you can't do that. You're a part of the body. And so you need to abide by what the, the head says. And the rest of the body needs to be well aware and be trying to heal you up when you get sick. That's what the body does, doesn't it? All the resources of the body go to the area that is infected. And so it is with us as Christians. We care for one another. Know that God loves us. His people love one another. 1 John 1. And love is not just something we say. It's something we do. Well, let's look at something else that's found in Christ. We have hope in Christ. What's hope? What is hope? Hope is desire plus expectation. Hope it in a wish. Hope it in something we just say, I hope. Now we use it that way in our society. But biblical hope is desire, wanting something, and expecting it. Well, we can have hope in Jesus Christ, but we can't without Him. In Romans 15 and verse 12, Paul talking to Gentile Christians says, and again Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him will the Gentiles have hope. Do you know that if we still lived under the Old Testament today that most of us watching this program tonight, including me, would be lost? Because the Gentiles had law, but it wasn't the law of Moses. We couldn't be saved by doing the law of Moses unless we were proselytes. But Romans chapter 1 says the Gentiles departed from God. They walked away from Him. And He gave them over to believe a lie and be damned. But Christ came to save both Jew and Gentile, bond and free, male and female, and to make us all one in Christ Jesus. In Christ. Hope in Christ. What is our hope? That God will be vindicated and that we will live with Him forever in heaven? The victory that is in Jesus, friends. It's an old hymn we sang, Victory in Jesus. Do you know what it means? It doesn't mean that we're going to win every ball game that we play. It doesn't mean, mean that we're always going to come out on top. It means there is victory in Christ. God is the winner. He, that's, the, that's the end of the story. Go to Ezekiel 36. God will be on top. God is, will be vindicated. And the way He's vindicated and when you, is when people like you and me do not fall prey to the desires of Satan. And we come out of it. And we abhor it and we hate it and we try our best to run as far from it as we can. We don't always run as fast as we can. And it overtakes us. But guess what? We repent and we come back to the Lord in relationship. That blood is applied to us again and again and again. And it just sets Satan on fire, literally. That that blood is so powerful. In Christ, friends, and that if you haven't had that blood applied in your life through baptism and faith and repentance and confession and the final act being baptized into Christ, born into the family of God, that new birth, then you're outside of Christ. And all these things we're talking about tonight, spiritual blessings in Christ, you don't have them. And that's a shame. The Lord wants you to. Well, let's look at something else. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2. Let's go to the chart, please. All right, this says we're sanctified in Christ. Let's read it. Talking here to Christians, he says, to the church of God, that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ. Now, what in the world does it mean to be sanctified in Christ? Well, we'll talk about that. Called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus. 
both their Lord and ours. So notice this, he's writing to the church of God. How does he describe them? The Lord, this is the Lord's church, friends. We're called to be saints. Did you know a Christian is a saint? And what is a saint? One set aside for a purpose. Saints are sanctified in Christ. With everyone who in every place calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus, both their Lord and ours. Now, some of you are sitting there saying, uh-huh, now you're in a, in, a, in a fix. You're a Church of Christ preacher and you're reading a passage that says that if we call on the name of the Lord, we're in Christ. Well, what does it mean to be sanctified in Christ, set apart in Christ, and call on the name of the Lord? What does that mean? Does it mean what people say today that all I have to do is call out the name of Jesus and I'm saved? No, it's not what it means. If so, the demons would be saved. James chapter 2 tells us that. The demons believe and tremble. Now you can come back to me, please. All right, called to be saints. How are we called? We're called by the gospel, all right? So being called by the gospel, we're obedient to what God tells us to do. It's like we're standing before God and say, tell me what to do. And we do it. So then we are called to be saints, together with all who in every place do the same thing. Call upon the name of the Lord, appeal to the authority of Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we're saints and we are sanctified, set apart, holy, put in a special place. The Lord has special relationship with us and it is only found in Christ. Friends, I don't know how you are, but I'm not saintly by myself, and I'm not sanctified for service to God by myself. That happens through the blood of Jesus Christ applied in baptism, and through my continued obedience and to His plan, my repentance, and my, for, and my prayers to the Lord. That's how it's continued. And so we have special relationship with another spiritual blessing. We're sanctified in Christ, sanctified. Now, if you're not there, if you're not in Christ, you can be, and we'll talk about that toward the end of the program. Well, we have the grace of God found only in Christ. Remember that grace that's extended to all men, all mankind? Everybody thinks that, that grace, some people even say grace only. Well, that's God's part. God's part is grace. He has extended it to those who are obedient to His Son. I give thanks to my God, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 4, always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in or through Christ Jesus. All right? So where is the grace of God found? Where can I be obedient to the Lord? It's in Christ. How do I get this grace extended in my life? It's for everybody. But there's a special group of people that receive it when they obey the commandments of God. All right, grace extended to all, but special relationship and receiving of that grace only in Christ Jesus. There is no grace extended, no grace realized until you are in Christ Jesus. Now again, God's grace is extended to all men but special relationship comes only in Christ. That's one of the spiritual blessings. So to be a full recipient of the grace of God, you must be obedient to what He said. You're in Christ when you do that, because without Christ, you're nothing. And while the grace is extended, there's no means of redemption. There's no means of salvation. God could love you, God could care for you, but if Christ had not come to this earth to die a perfect sacrifice on the cross for our sins, we couldn't be beneficiaries of that grace. You see how God thought of everything? He thought of it all. He didn't, get, he, he didn't forget anything, did He? Grace extended, but how is it received? Only in His Son. God so loved the world, what was the solution? Sending His Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Again, not belief only, 
but a recipient of all the things God has told us to do. Well, 1 Corinthians 1, 5, Paul goes on to talk to this church and he says you are enriched in Christ. Life is so much more full in Christ Jesus, friends. In every way you were enriched in Him with all speech and all knowledge. Now that's the here and now. Your life means something more when you're in Christ, friends. Did you know that? Outside of Christ, your life is sort of like this. Tell me if I'm right. Call in, tell us, tell me if I'm describing the worldly life. You just get up, you go to work, if you're not hung over, and then you come home, and there's a humdrumness to life. There's no richness to life, there's no enriching. But do you know what, to the Christian, things mean something that didn't mean anything before. You see the beauty that is all around you every day. You appreciate things when you look out into the world and see these beautiful leaves that has changed. See the seasons change. And know it was your father that's doing all this. And you know that when you see a baby born, that that is a part of, part of, has a spark of God within him. And you see all the things of this life, you see the, the good times, the bad times, and even in the tough times, you see the benefits of it. And you learn to count it all joy when you fall into divers trials. Because you as a child of God, enriched in Christ, know you don't walk through a storm by yourself. He's right there. You remember there's a storm at sea that tested Peter one time. And he walked on the water as long as he kept his eye on his master. He walked through the storm as long as he kept his eye on his master. But when he began to pay more attention to the storm than to his master, he sunk. That's a lesson for us. You know, the world doesn't understand that. People that live worldly lives, they have no idea how in the world people in the church can, be, can act so happy and can live through all types of tough times and still keep good attitudes. We're enriched in Christ. And if we dwell in Christ, if we are abiding in Him, then we're rich. We may not have two cents to rub together. The beggar is the one in Luke that did not have much on this earth, but he had a mansion later, didn't he? He had wonderful things later. And it was the rich man who gave all of his life to serving himself that was in torment. So, blessed here, blessed there. Which do you want? Well, eternity is much longer than time. So I want an eternal home, don't you? I want something that lasts. And that's found only in Christ. Again, one of the spiritual blessings enriched we are wealthy beyond measure when we're in Christ. Some would say that Christ, when He lived on this earth, was a poor man. But that would be the person that didn't realize what, who He was. He was certainly sad. He was certainly a person who had experienced all the emotions. But He knew He was going back to His Father. And so He was able to endure all the things He went through. And you can too. God never promised it would be smooth sailing if, we're just, if we serve Him. But He did promise us that it will all be worth it one day. What a rich blessing that we have in Christ. And He will enrich us in His Son. Much better life than the world, that's for sure. Well, again, 1 Corinthians 15, 22, For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. We'll be made alive how? In Christ. We'll live eternally, folks. Did you know that? We won't just die and that's it. We have a home in heaven and we're aiming to get there. And so we have a purpose. You know, you ever seen anybody with no purpose? We have a purpose. We're made alive in Christ. And though the world may try to drop us, the New Testament Christians taught us something. Do you know the historians commented about the way New Testament Christians went to their deaths in Rome? The Caesars would put them in arenas for their entertainment. But it wasn't long before the people and the soldiers began to notice that these people are different. They're facing death and they're singing hymns. 
They're facing death and they're praying together. And they're rejoicing in this Lord they call Jesus. This is the quotes from the historians of the first century. Not in the Bible. But do you know what happened? It shook some of those soldiers. How can someone die like this? Death is usually something that people dread. Jesus dreaded the physical death. It's not fun to die. We don't long to die, but it is a fact that we will die. But to the Christian, he knows that it's not an end. It's just a beginning of eternal things. And so he waits for the judgment in the bosom of Abraham. And he longs to go home and face the Lord and see the Lord at the resurrection. Friends, people in the world, people that live a, a worldly life, they in their real heart of hearts, I think, know they don't have this blessing. They know that they're not pleasing to God. And you may be one watching tonight, and you're sitting there and you're saying, you're talking, right, you're talking about me, preacher. Well, if you're in that shape, yeah, I am. Because there's a lot of people throughout all time that have chosen to live their lives outside of Christ. And they have forfeited, they have kept themselves away from the spiritual blessings that are in Christ. And they're out there. All these things we've talked about so far tonight are there for all of us. And to all of us who are Christians, I don't know how you are, but getting this lesson together today, I really realize that I am counting my blessings. I'm doing what the song says. And blessings are much more than possessions. These are the things that matter that are in Christ, live in Christ. The things that are the end for everybody else are the beginning for us. Even when we're tempted and tried, we rejoice and we thank God that we're counted worthy to suffer for Him. People in the world don't understand that. But it's all in two words. Only in, well, three words, only in Christ can I be this way. And I'd like to tell you about it if you give me the chance. So would the members of the church at Newton. So would any Christian you can find, a New Testament Christian. We want to tell you about this wonderful life, these blessings that are there for you also. Would you like it? Well, call up. Set up a Bible study with us in your home or in some restaurant somewhere if you are fearful of, of those types of things and you, you would not be crazy to be that way. No one will come to teach you by, your, by themselves. There will be, be two or three. And so we will not come in and try to hurt you in any way. But in a world where everybody is suspicious and we need to be cautious, we want you to know all we want to do is study the Bible with you and to show you these blessings that are available for you. You want some of this? Well, it's out there for you. We're glad, we'll be glad to talk about it. Matter of fact, we can't stop talking about it. So you just give us a chance. Well, another thing is in Christ is I can be established. I can be anointed in Christ. Established and anointed, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. And if you're having trouble finding the passages, we'll go right up here to read it. Hopefully you're still with us. 2 Corinthians 1, 21. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ. And He has anointed us. What does it mean to be anointed? Hmm. I thought that was something they did to kings. Well, there's one true king. But do you know we're royalty? We're anointed by God. We're established in Christ. We're set. That term established means set. We have a firmness to us. We have a foundation to us. That foundation is Christ. And we have been anointed in Christ. We are a royal priesthood, a holy people to the praise of God in Christ. Well, He establishes us. You know, someone says, well, how can Christians stand up when everything's fallen down? Because we're established. We can stand in the midst of the storm and not be shaken. That's what you and I can do. 
And I'll tell you what, folks, you can't do that without some peace, inner peace. Turn to Philippians chapter 4 if you have your Bibles. This is not on the charts. But in Philippians chapter 4, we find that there is something that, is, that a Christian experiences that is not found anywhere else. It, we'll get to it at some point, maybe even tonight. But I want to jump ahead just a minute to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 7. And it is an important thing to remember. He says, Rejoice in the Lord, verse 4. And again I say, Rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord's coming. Be careful or be anxious in nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. God listens to us. He listens to His children. And we are to rejoice and to take our case to Him. But look at verse 7. We're not to be anxious in this life. But then verse 7, And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through or in Christ Jesus. Got a peace? Do you have that kind of peace? Are you established? Are you anointed in Christ? If you do, you have this peace that the world thinks, how in the world? It's the craziest thing. Those people were over there singing when all kinds of bad things were happening to them. Well, you go to Acts 16, you see how that literally happened. Paul and Silas were in jail. They were in the inner prison. They had been locked up in chains, secured, and an earthquake came. And they were praying and singing at midnight. The jailer, thinking he was going to lose all of his prisoners and Rome would kill him anyway, was ready to put his sword through himself. And Paul cried out, he says, don't do yourself any harm, we're all here. What were they doing? They were singing. An earthquake was that, was that what you would do? Did you sing hymns to God when an earthquake should coming? Somebody says, yeah, I would. Well, why would you? You see, outside circumstances didn't determine whether Paul was going to be faithful or not, nor Silas, nor should it any Christian. Whatever happens in this life, we don't give up. We don't despair. We don't throw our hands up. Oh, I, yeah. no, we just stay the course. And we keep our eyes focused on the Lord because we're established. We're anointed in Him. We're a kingdom of priests. We're a holy people. We're a royal priesthood. And so we have rulership. We have an advantage here in this life because we belong to God. And we walk like it and we act like it. And we don't fall apart in every type of situation that comes up because we have strength, not our own. We have strength, a promise from the Lord that He's with us no matter where we go. Romans chapter 8, if God be for us, who can be against us? Now you think about that deeply and circle that. That's Romans 8, I believe it's verse 39. But if God is for us, but read the whole Ro Romans 8 chapter because this is a masterpiece, by the way, of Christ what, what Christians have. Well, is there anything else found in Christ? Oh, yes. Here we go. Now we're new creatures. Hmm. A new creature in Christ. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Read with me if you will as we go to our chart. So if anyone's in Christ, he is a what? A new creation. The old has passed away. And behold, the new has come. Okay? So if when we put off, we put on, don't we? We put off the old, we put on the new. What happens to the old? We put it away. It's passed away. It's done. But if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. When was the last time you were a new creation? When you were born. When you were begotten. In the womb, 
You were a new creation of God. And you can be that again. As you live your life, you're prone to ups and downs, sins that may confront you, and you can be made new again. Now, friends, consider, if you will, and come back to me, please. Thank you. Consider, if you will, that this page is a page of your sins. You, I hope you can see that it has writing all over it. And this writing is all of the sins that you committed today. And let's say you have a book of these, a big book. And the Lord says, okay, you have come to me, you've been obedient to what I said, then it doesn't matter what you've ever done as long as you are willing to repent of it, and that means turning away from it. You're buried in the waters of baptism and you come forth a new creature, and I'll give you a clean page. Not only now when you're born into Christ through baptism, but every day that you live as a Christian, you can pillow your head at night with a clean sheet and sleep in peace and contentment knowing if the next thing you see is eternity, that you're okay. Wow, what a blessing. No one that I know of in this life will give you what the Lord will give you as far as that deal. It's not all dependent on us, people. A lot of times we live our lives thinking that we have, it's all dependent on what we do. Notice this term in Christ. It's in Him that we have redemption. It's in Him that we are new creatures, that the old has passed away and the new has come. And we can be refreshed daily. We can be renewed daily through prayer and through repentance, true repentance. And we can stand justified to Him just as clean as the day we were born into Christ in baptism and all of our sins were washed away. Friends, that's a blessing in Christ. And that's how we can rejoice, knowing our sins are taken care of. And we have lived according to what God has told us to do. And when we have fallen short, we ask Him to forgive us and do our best to do better every day we live. The Lord is there for us. And we have, can be a new creature in Christ. I don't know what you've done in your life, if you're watching tonight, and maybe you're sitting there, as one watcher told me one time when he came to church, he said, I heard about you, preacher, when I was getting over a drunk. Maybe you're listening tonight, friend. Hope you are. Come, give me a call. But again, he was very miserable coming out of a, a hangover. And you know what he said? He said, I get sad when I get drunk and I was running around trying to find somebody that wasn't yelling at me. And you were the one that didn't yell. He said, so I listened to what you had to say. Well, friends, he talked about being a new creature. He talked about wanting these spiritual blessings. But sadly, this young, this young person never did what God said to do. And I pray even today that he'll do that and finally decide to put away that old man and come be made new in Christ Jesus. Been praying for that for a while. Praying not only for him, but for all who don't realize what they're missing in Christ. Come receive these blessings. We'll baptize you tonight into Christ if you want us to, but we're gonna be sure that you know what it means to be in Christ and that it's not something you do on a whim. It's not something you do on a flight of emotion. It's something you do when your heart is broken by reading the story of what happened for your salvation. And you realize, and you have no hold back, I will do whatever the Lord tells me to do. That's when you are the new creature in Christ. And you are the pot, you're the clay, and the Lord is the potter, and He will mold you and make you into something you never imagined you could be. So friends, what else is found in Christ? 
righteousness. I have become righteous in Christ, not self-righteous, but righteous in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For our sakes He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Wow! We can become not only righteous, but we can become the righteousness of God. Not self-righteous like the Pharisee, but humbly righteous, because we know that our righteousness doesn't come from ourselves. It's in Christ, all right? It's in Him, when we are made in Him, and when we are conformed to His image, then we're righteous in Christ. Well, let's look again. Another thing that's found in Christ is being reconciled in Christ. Remember what was lost in the garden in Genesis chapter 3? Now we are reconciled, conciliatory. Someone who's conciliatory is friendly. And so we are now made friends again. We are friendly. God is our friend again. We are, have been estranged. We've been enemies. Our lifestyle has shown that we are, we are devout enemies of what He has done. And so when we are in Christ, we have come back to Him. We are reconciled like the prodigal son and his father. They were brought back together. And so it is with us when we are in Christ. But we can only be reconciled to God, friends, when we are in Christ. Look, if you will, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 and 19, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now friends, that's all part of God's grace extended to us, that we can be reconciled to Him in spite of the things that we have done against Him. But you know what it takes to erase all of that? The blood of Christ. And it is only found in Him. You're looking for answers to your misery? You're looking to answers to your sins? You want to be one with God again? Then you need to come and be a recipient of the erasing power of, to sin of the blood of Christ, the blotting out of your sins by the blood of Christ. Somebody says, well, we've heard this, this phrase, in Christ, preacher, quite a bit tonight. What does it mean to be in Christ? We're getting there. Again, freedom in Christ. Yea, because of false brethren secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom which we have in Christ, so that they might bring us into slavery. Be not, don't ever be deceived by the things of this world and think that somehow it's, it's freeing you up. The free life, the life where we have no chains, that's how songs and other things relate to that, how, how, how sin relates to those things. It wants us to think, and the devil wants us to think, that we're chained up if we're righteous, and that true freedom is outside of the Lord. Well, no, a bigger lie has never been told than that one, that Christ can't do anything for us, but Satan can do everything for us. Oh my, that's a horrible, horrible lie. So we see that we can be free in Christ, right? The devil wants us to be slaves to him. The Lord wants us to be slaves to Him. So what does it mean to be a slave? Not in bondage to sin, that's what Satan offers us, but freedom in Christ, while still slaves, servants of His, but a great Master who frees us through His blood. And we trust Him, and He won't hurt us, and we know that He will always have good things in mind for us. But yet we also know that Satan is still down there trying to reel us in, and he's throwing all types of stumbling blocks and problems before us. But we stand with Christ, and we do as thus saith the Lord in Matthew chapter 4. That's how Satan, or how, how Christ resisted temptation. And we give a thus saith the Lord, and guess what happens? Satan leaves, because he doesn't like the Bible. And he doesn't like people that stand with Jesus Christ, and, you, and he is their fortress. He is their rock. He is their strength. He's their hiding place. 
He's the cleft of the rock where we, where we go in and there is true safety. Well, are you free in Christ? Well, look again. Are you justified? Not are you justifiable, but are you justified in Christ? We know that a person is not justified by works of the old law, and that's what it should be there. But through, that's the context, talking about the old law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. So we also, who have believed in Christ Jesus, in order to be justified by faith in Christ, notice the in Christ things here, okay? You've got one, two, three of them. In order to be justified by faith in Christ, and not by works of the law, because by works of the law no one is justified. There's this false idea that all we have to do is do stuff for the Lord. Well, that's works only salvation, friends, and the Bible doesn't teach that. We are made just by the Lord. We deserve a sentence of death, but in Christ He pronounces no other sentence for us than justified. Justified. And so we have this term justified and sanctified. Do they happen at different times? No, they happen at the same time. We are sanctified and justified by the Lord. There's a denomination out there in this area, the Baptist Church. Some Baptist churches teach this, not all. But they say that justification and sanctification are two different things, that you are justified in Christ, and then later you are sanctified. You have a second work of grace come into your heart. Well, the Bible says that they both happen at the same time. We're justified and sanctified in the Lord when we come to Him in baptism and we repent of our sins and we are confessing Christ and we all of that based upon our hearing of God's Word. Well, that blood is applied, so therefore what are we? We are just, justified through Christ, not on our own. All right. Well, let's look at another one here. Another thing found in Christ is the blessings of Abraham are found in Christ. Go back to Genesis chapter 12 and you see there was a threefold promise given to Abraham, wasn't there? Well, Galatians 3.14, in Christ the blessing of Abraham might come to us, the Gentiles, so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Okay, so again, blessings that were given to Abraham. You remember Abraham was not at the time that he was called and that the dream or that the promise was given to him. He wasn't at the time a Jew. A Jew. He was a Gentile because everybody was Gentiles. And so we see that Abraham was given a threefold promise. You know what that promise was? It was one promise, but threefold in nature. There was a land part to it, there was a nation part to it, and there was a seed part to it. The land and the nation promise in this whole scheme of redemption, remember how we talked about that at the beginning of our lesson? This whole scheme of redemption unfolding, the land and the nation promise are fulfilled before the Old Testament pages are closed. And you know what all everything in the end part of the Old Testament is pointing to? Pointing to Jesus. The forerunner, Malachi ends with talking about the Elijah who would come and prepare the way. In the spirit of Elijah, he would come. Well, that's John the Baptist, and he was the one that prepared the way. He's a cousin to Jesus. But now the seed is coming, the seed is coming, the seed is coming. The promise of Abraham, promise to Abraham. So it's through Christ, in Christ. See how we're talking about this in Christ, and it all works into this promise to Abraham? Now, Abraham is the story of that's in Genesis. But these blessings in Galatians 3 and 14 are hundreds of years later, thousands of years later, actually. So you see how everything threads together? The story of how God is bringing us back together. And all of us, what a great message, can receive the blessings that were promised to Abraham in Christ. Okay? We don't receive a new nation because the nation promise given to Abraham was fulfilled in the Old Testament. But is there a promise that is given of a new body, a new kingdom? Yes, it is the church. And you and I have that today. 
And the church is here, the body is here, the kingdom is here. And we're not waiting for it to come, friends. It's now, we enjoy it right now. Well, another thing that's found in Christ is that we're sons of God in Christ. I can't be naturally a son of God, and neither can you. There's only one of those, that's Jesus. But for in Christ, you are all the sons of God through faith. Galatians 3, 26. Friends, I don't know about you, but this is one of the biggest blessings in Christ right here. That I am a recipient of the inheritance of eternal life, and that I will judge the angels. That I'm a son of God. Not a natural son of God. But I am a son of God through Christ Jesus. He was raised up from the dead, and I can be too. We can have life eternal. He has life eternal, and we can have it too. Now, we're adopted children of God, but we have equal benefit of eternal life. I'm looking forward to that, aren't you? To live forever. And I don't have to take any pills, and I don't have to take any medicines of any kind. I don't have to eat right, you know, to stay here. All these things will go away, and we'll have a new body. We'll have a redeemed body. We don't know what we'll look like, but we'll look like Jesus because we're related. Family relationship. You know how many people, maybe you're one of them, walk around this world with no family? That's a sad existence, but do you know in Christ there's never a place we go we don't have family? There's Christians all over the world My wife and I have met with them in different places we've been, in Greece and in Rome and in Australia and in different places we've been, all around this country, Canada, and every every state out here in this world that we have in our country, you can find children of God there. And they're your relatives and you've never met them. Isn't that awesome? There's always a fresh member of the family of God. And you know what else? You can watch new members being born when you watch baptisms. And you see them having a new birth in Christ. A new baby is born into the kingdom of the Lord. That's a blessing that is found only in Christ, that we are sons of God in Christ. Well, we are also one in Christ. Galatians 3 and verse 27, or 28. You know, I don't know how you are, but I turned the TV on by accident today just for noise. You ever do that? Just turn the radio or something on just for background noise? And boy, was I sorry. Boy, you talk about divided. Here's this, our country's divided, isn't it? Now, is there, a, is there a, a magic pill that would cure all the division that exists in this world? Yeah, there is, if everybody lived like Christ. Now, is that going to happen? Probably not. But it could happen if everybody would use the same standard and do unto others as they would have them do unto them and be, have the Spirit of Christ in them. Then we could all be one. Jesus prayed for it in John 17, you remember? that they all might be one in us, as Thou art in me, Father, and I in Thee, that they all might be one in us." Talking for about His disciples and extended it to us. The Lord doesn't like the division. Just in the denominational world, you know the denominational world is a little bit worse in my mind than the political world. Because the, the decisions that are made in denominationalism, those are, those are, those are soul-changing things. Well, there's neither Jew nor Greek now, he says. Now, in a bigoted world of Rome, where a Jew and a Greek hated one another, guess what? Now, in Christ, you have Jews and Greeks meeting together in the same church. There's neither slave nor free. In a country, in an empire, where a free man was elite and a slave was nothing but a dog to be used in Christ, we're all one. There's no male or female. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody was transgender. Let's, let's get that out there very clearly. 
It's just saying that it doesn't matter whether you're male or female. Males were preferred in the Roman world. A female was a second class citizen. But in Christ she's not. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now there are different roles. The male and the female still have different roles. And the slave and the free, the book of Philemon really tells us about that. They still have their role. The slave produces his, his uh, job and the master, the free man, does not lord it over him. And the Jew and the Greek, you don't change nationalities when you obey the gospel, but you are one in Christ. The white is no better than the black. The black's no better in worth than anyone else. We are all one, and we don't worry about those things. And in Christ, these things go away, friends. And if we would all learn this, we'd be much better off, wouldn't we? Now, does that mean God accepts people in their sins? No, it does not. Someone says, well, now you just opened the door there for, for us to have fellowship with sinners. I did not. There's a standard by which we become one in Christ. Remember what we talked about at the beginning? And one of them is repentance from your sins. Now sins are sins, aren't they? And Galatians 5.19 and, and many other passages give lists of sins. And among those are fornication, adultery, uncleanness, lasciviousness, licentiousness, witchcraft, murders, drunkenness, revelry, all of these things are sins. And so can a person continue to be a fornicator and be one with his brethren in Christ? Nope. And that's whether or not the, the fornication is hetero or homosexual or any number of different brands that are out there. Well, if it's fornication, it's fornication, isn't it? And it's a sin against God. And you cannot continue in sin, Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, that grace might abound. The Lord will forgive all sin. There's no sin that is any worse than the other one. Revelation 21, 8, all liars will have their part in the lake of fire and brimstone. Well, and the fearful, the moral coward, same way. So, sin is sin. Sin separates us from God, and the wages of sin is death. But we can become one in Christ, and we can be forgiven of all of our sins and have a unity together in Christ. Well, again, that's waiting for you. Are you one with Christ? Can two walk together? The Old Testament writer observes, except they be agreed. So we make Christ's will our will, and we walk hand in hand, one purpose, one function, to please the Lord. Well, again, going back, we kind of backed up a little bit now, and we're back in Ephesians 1, 3. Every spiritual blessing that exists is in Christ. He says here, and it's a really rejoicing passage, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who, Christ, has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Going home one day, folks. You Are you? Well, every one of us is going home somewhere. We'll go home to an eternal torment in hell, or we'll go home to be with the Lord in a beautiful place called heaven. All spiritual blessings exist right now in Christ Jesus. Now, somebody says, you hadn't gone to heaven yet. No, but I know, I know I can, and I'm on my way. It's like a fellow says, I hadn't gotten there yet, but I'm on my way, you know. What's your goal? To get to heaven? Remember the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, keep the law. He says, well, I've been doing that since I was a child, which is a pretty good compliment. And the Lord never challenged him on that. And he says, well, one thing you're lacking. The Lord, being the Lord, knew what the man lacked. And he says, one, man, one thing you're lacking. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then take up your cross and follow me. 
You know, the Lord was teaching the principle He taught when He washed feet. And He was teaching the principle He had talked about before when He says, the talked about the cost of discipleship. Unless a man is willing to forsake all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Have you done that? There's sometimes I think I have, but you know there's other times I look and I say, boy, I tell you what, there's something holding pretty strong with me. And I think I've given it all up, but maybe I haven't. That's when you hit your knees and go to God in prayer and say, forgive me. Still got something there that I'm holding on to. Help me turn it loose. And the Lord will help you through His Word. He's directed us the same way. All spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. He gave us a book with all the answers in it. That's one of the spiritual blessings. And we've talked about the other ones tonight. Do you want to be a recipient of every spiritual blessing the Lord has in mind? Then you come to Christ. Somebody says, now wait a minute, there you go again. We've talked about in Christ, we've talked about in Christ, you've talked about all these passages, and I've been reading them to, with you, and yeah, it does say in Christ, but what does it mean? How do, God, how do I get in Christ? It's a good question. I wish all of us could ask that question. How do I get in Christ? Back in Acts chapter 2, there were some people that said, men and brethren, what shall we do? That's a great question, isn't it? I hope you're asking that question right now with yourself. And notice the doing. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice the answer in Acts 2 and verse 38 was not, there's nothing you can do. God's grace has done it for you. Jesus has already been hung on the cross and died. He's been buried, and now He's arisen and ascended. And so there's not anything you can do. The Lord's done it all for you. That's not the answer, was it? The answer was not, well, just accept God as your, or Jesus as your personal Savior and invite Him into your life and you'll be saved. That wasn't the answer. You got your Bibles? Turn over there to Acts 2 and verse 38. What was the answer when the people on Pentecost, the murderers of Jesus, asked what they could do? Well, what does that mean? They were told to repent and be baptized, every one of them, by the authority of Jesus Christ. And they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. You know what that is? Salvation. And it's promised to all people. Friend, you can be saved. And it's just as simple as coming to Christ and doing what He has told you to do. What shall we do? You know a Jew knew what he had to do to atone for sin under the old law? But they weren't told, go get a perfect lamb, and sacrifice him, and your sins are going. No. They knew after hearing the lesson they heard about Jesus and who He was, they knew they had to do something different. And they asked, what shall we do? You know, the Philippian jailer, same thing. What shall I do? What shall you do? How far are you from the kingdom? If you're watching this program, I would venture to say that as the world will look at it, you're a pretty good person. You believe in the Bible. You believe in spiritual things, you believe in a moral life. Are you close to the kingdom? Yes. There was a man in Acts chapter 10 named Cornelius. He was a devout man. He gave alms to the poor. And he even built synagogues for the, for the Jews, even though he wasn't a Jew. He was a good man, but he wasn't saved. And so, when it came, when time came for Paul or for Peter to go preach to him, you know what happened? He got his whole family together and his friends, and he said, "We are all here to hear. We want to hear what you have to say, Peter." And so Peter preached Christ to them. He preached Jesus to them. And he preached salvation, he preached the body, he preached the church, 
preached the kingdom. He preached the head, the body. He talked about the Jesus Christ and who He is and what blessings are found in Christ. And when He was through, Cornelius and his household were all baptized. Born into the family of God, they were in Christ. Here's a man that's a good man. Let's go over to Acts chapter 22. And let's read about the Apostle Paul who was once called Saul. And what, what about him? He was breathing out threatenings. And when Stephen was stoned in Acts 6, what was happening to him? He was being, he was being destroyed. He was being stoned for preaching the gospel. And they laid their coats at the feet of a man named Saul of Tarsus. He was sincere. He, he, he was sincere with his conscience, and every, he, whatever he did, he was killing Christians and having no particular conscience at all about it. But when he was traveling to Damascus to deliver Christians to be killed or tried, a bright light shone, and the Lord appeared to him, but he wasn't saved then. He was told to go into the city. And it would be told him what to do. He was to find a man's house named Ananias. And so, not being able to see, he was led there. And Ananias had been told by the Lord that Saul would be coming. And so Saul, or Ananias, taught Saul the gospel. And Saul, this good man, sincere man, although a persecutor of Christians, he says, after he was talked to, talked to in Acts 22 and verse 16, Ananias says to him, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Now you know there are people that would have Saul saved in his sins because they would have him back on the road to Damascus being saved. But then he gets to Ananias and he says he's still in his sins. You know, Paul said to the Lord, Who art thou, Lord? Did he confess with his mouth who the Lord was? He sure did. But he wasn't saved by that. He had to go into the city, and it would be told him what he should do. Did he have faith? Mm hmm And he listened to Ananias as he talked to him. And Ananias, but they didn't have a Bible to preach out of, so he was preaching to him from what the Lord told him to say. And so he was teaching. And you know what happened? Paul didn't say, well, I'm, the, I'm a Jew of Jews. I'm the most devout. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. And if I'm not going to heaven, nobody is. Well, he didn't say that. He submitted. A little later on, there's a man named Apollos. And he thinks he's right. He's real close to being right. But he doesn't have it right. So two regular Christians, Aquila and Priscilla, hear what he's teaching, and while it's powerful, he has a very eloquent manner, it is not the truth. And so they take him aside, and they explain to him the way more perfectly. So here's a preacher that's popular, and here's two people that are just regular everyday Christians, tent makers, and they take him aside and they tell him what the truth is. You know what he says? You can't tell me what to do. I'm a preacher. I'm not changing for anybody. No, he obeyed the gospel. He was baptized. He was close to the kingdom, but he wasn't in it yet. Well, friends, in Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, you're all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And then watch the rest of it. Sentence isn't true yet. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How do you get in Christ? How do you get into Christ? You're baptized into Christ. For the remission of your sins, the Lord adds you to His church, and then you continue in the Apostles' Doctrine, Breaking of Bread and Prayer. And the Lord adds to the church daily. Who? Those who are being saved. Who are the saved? Those who come to Christ. Salvation in no other name. Can't come to the Father by anyone else but Jesus. 
So it's an exclusive religion. This being in Christ is an exclusive relationship. All these blessings are exclusive to those who are in Christ. Somebody says, well, that's pretty bigoted. No, that's God's plan, friend. Watch out or you'll be blasphemous. Okay? God's plan is that these things only be found, these relationships, these blessings, only be found in Christ Jesus. He didn't want the whole world to have these blessings. Only those that are willing to accept what His Son has done and what He did in sending His Son to die. Tremendous sacrifice. Does Jesus have the right to tell you what to do? He sure does. He gave His life for you. You hear story after story after story of people that have been in the military that say, I owe this man my life. Well, you know the only one we owe our life to spiritually is Jesus Christ. We owe Him our spiritual lives. It's Him. It's no particular man on this earth that you owe your spiritual life to. It's Jesus Christ. And all spiritual blessings are found in Him. Well, is there anything else that's found in Christ? Oh yes, there's so many more. So many more. We're chosen in Christ. We also know that we're redeemed in Christ. We talked about that. We are obtained the inheritance in Christ. We also know that we have hope in Christ. We've talked about that. And we are also sealed in Christ. And we also know that we're created in Christ. This new workmanship created for good works. Did you know you were put here to do good when you're in Christ? You have a purpose. What's your good? What's your purpose? Doing good works. Pleasing the Lord. Pleasing your Father in Christ. Well, we're brought nigh to God in Christ. Near to the heart of God? That's only in Christ. We are joined in Christ together. All of us together. We are God's dwelling place in Christ. Ephesians 2.22 in Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's talking there about a relationship in the church. A dwelling place for God. And we also know that we are people that are partakers of the promise in Christ. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. We also find that we have bold access to the Father in Christ. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in Him. Friends, the Christian can pillow his head at night in prayer before he goes to sleep and know that God's listening. Do you know that's a blessing that's only found in Christ? Somebody says, now wait just a minute, preacher, I, I pray. Okay, that's a wonderful thing that you pray. But let me ask you, is God bound to, to answer your prayers if you're not even one of His children? And you could care less about Jesus Christ? Mm -mm. And you know what He said? Prayer is a spiritual blessing. Only His people, only those that are in Christ can come to Him boldly and have confidence that He listens and that He answers their prayers. Notice in James, it's the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man. We're made righteous in Christ. So, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. God hears not sinners, friends. So we must be in Christ, and prayer is a peculiar privilege of those in Christ. Now that doesn't mean that God can't hear the prayers of others, but He's only, only, only promised to answer the prayers of His children. Now my neighbor may come over and ask for something that I've got, and I may choose to give it to him. But I'll tell you what, if my children come up and they say, Dad, when you, when you die, can we have this as an inheritance? And I say, yes then these, a special relationship with my children that I don't have with my neighbor, you see. 
Now also Ephesians 4.32, forgiven in Christ. And if God forgave us, we should forgive one another. All right? Well, so many more things. Peace in Christ we talked about, redemption, knowledge in Christ. We also that we build it up in Christ. We're filled, full in Christ. Not, not sort of. We're circumcised in Christ. It's a circumcision of the heart. In Him also, Colossians 2, 2, 2 11, you were circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Jesus Christ. He cuts away that old man of sin and we are able to be in right relationship with Him. Because remember, He doesn't dwell where sin is. Well, friends, again, and we, we bid you to turn in, tune in next time to our program. We're going to talk about some things about how we know God exists. How do we know that God exists? That's what we're going to be talking about on the next program in two weeks now. Two weeks. Well, do you know God exists? Can we know that God exists? Is there a way for us to determine whether God exists or not? And we're going to talk about that. Brother Dan King a few weeks ago talked about that subject. And we're going to go a little bit different route in talking about that and not be quite as deep as he was, but he had a masterpiece of a lesson on that. And if you want to go back and look at the archives, it is well worth it. Well, we want to invite you to attend the Assemblies of the St. James Church of Christ, uh, Newton Church of Christ. It meets at St. James Church Road, 656. And we want you, if you will, to tune in and be with them. Go to their services and be with them. Their assembly times are Bible study at 9.30 and worship at 11. Wednesday night Bible studies at 7 o'clock. And also the Word and Swords brought to you by the Newton Church of Christ. Uh, email is contact at wordandsword.com. Phone number is 828-465-3009. The mail, just snail mail, P.O. Box 893, Newton, North Carolina. Wordandsword.com. Go to it. Avail yourself of the opportunity to know more about God's Word. And be a person, friends, and if you want to be in Christ, you just give us a call. And we'll help you. Tune in again Tuesday, December the 3rd. The year is fast going by at 8 to 8 p.m. And we'll be talking about how do we know that God exists. Thank you for your time tonight. You've been very gracious in inviting us into your home. And good evening.